Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. Question R has been dropped in the Lok Sabha schedule of monsoon session. See, the parliament is all set to convene for the monsoon session in the middle of a raging pandemic. If you remember, we have discussed over the last few months that the budget session of the parliament had been completely disrupted as a result of the breakout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, after a delay, the monsoon session is all set to begin. But the schedule that has been brought out by the Lok Sabha Secretariat with the approval of the government has triggered a controversy and it has invited criticism from the opposition parties. Because as per the schedule for the monsoon session, key parliamentary tools are being suspended or they are being curtailed in order to take into account the challenges posed by the pandemic. Key parliamentary tools such as the question hour and private members business is being completely suspended for the monsoon session whereas zero hour is being curtailed or restricted. Earlier, the opposition parties were criticizing the government for not allowing the parliament to convene through virtual proceedings by citing the pandemic as an excuse. When the entire world had shifted to virtual functioning, the Indian parliament and its committees were not allowed to function virtually because the government had cited the limitations posed by the rules of the house. So for this, the opposition parties had criticized the government for not allowing the parliament to function because the parliament being one of the key pillars of a democracy is critical to hold the government accountable. One way through which the parliament holds the executive accountable is through various parliamentary tools such as the question hour, zero hour, etc. during which questions can be raised against the executive and as well as through various other motions that are available to the members of the parliament. Now, the government has finally moved to convene the monsoon session, but the schedule that has been brought out by the secretariat clearly shows that question R and private member business is being suspended and the zero hour proceedings are being restricted to just around 30 minutes per day. See, under normal circumstances, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, they used to meet from morning till late in the evening. The initial hours were usually allocated for question R and zero R. Then after a small lunch break, the two houses would convene to conduct regular legislative business. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the session timings have to be altered in order to enforce social distancing and to carry out disinfection in order to keep the COVID-19 outbreak within the parliament under check. So as per the revised schedule, the timings of both the houses has been curtailed to just around four hours each and they would be convening in a staggered manner on any given day in order to enforce social distancing. As per the schedule, in the initial week, the Lok Sabha shall convene in the morning, whereas the Rajya Sabha shall convene in the evening. Then from the second week onwards, the Lok Sabha shall convene in the evening, whereas the Rajya Sabha shall convene in the morning. So this limited schedule provides just four hours of business to each house. And hence, the government has justified its decision by stating that this is an extraordinary situation that we are dealing with. But the opposition parties have criticized the government and they have said that the government is trying to escape parliamentary accountability by suspending and restricting key parliamentary tools that are essential to hold the executive accountable. The opposition MPs are even referring to this as a breach of their parliamentary privilege. So in this context, let us talk about question R, zero R and private members business in more detail. See, the first hour of every parliamentary sitting was allocated for the question R. This duration of the parliamentary session was referred to as question R. And during this period, the opposition MPs were allowed to ask questions to the ministers. And this was one way through which the parliament was holding the executive accountable. Proceedings of the question R are regulated by the rules of procedure of both the houses. And accordingly, opposition MPs are allowed to ask three types of questions during the question R. This includes the start question, the unstart question, and as well as short notice questions. As per the rules, opposition MPs are supposed to submit these questions 15 days in advance so that the concerned minister can take the assistance of his ministry and prepare adequately to answer these questions on the floor of the house. This advance notice period applies for start questions and as well as unstart questions. And for a start question that is distinguished with an asterisk, the concerned minister is required to provide an oral answer on the floor of the house 
and he is also obligated to take up any supplementary questions that can follow. So this is a route through which the opposition parties can question the government and hold it accountable on the floor of the house and as well as in front of the public. Whereas an unstarred question can be provided with a written answer by the ministry and hence supplementary questions cannot follow in this regard. Usually unstarred questions are asked by MPs if they are looking to collect more data and information on government policies. Then a short notice question can be asked by giving a notice of less than 10 days and these questions are also answered orally by the ministers. Usually short notice questions are allowed in order to address any matter of urgent importance. So during this question hour, MPs get an opportunity to hold the government and its ministers accountable for their actions and they can even bring out additional information from the government on key policies and decisions and they can push the respective ministries to take any suitable action. Since independence, this parliamentary tool has been successfully used by MPs for holding the government accountable for its acts of commission and omission and such questions have led to the uncovering of a number of financial irregularities and it has also brought out crucial data and information into the public domain. Ever since the live telecast of question hour began in 1991, it has become one of the most visible aspects of the functioning of the Indian Parliament. This infographic that has been sourced from PRS legislative research shows how the time that has been allocated for question hour has been utilized over the last two decades. In sessions where the utilization ratio was in the range of 60 to 80 percent, the MPs were very proactive in questioning the government and holding it accountable. But in sessions where the utilization ratio was very low, the question hour was mainly used for disrupting the functioning of the house and it has also been witness to unparliamentary behavior. But irrespective of that, the question hour is a very crucial tool that is available to the opposition parties to question the government on the floor of the house and in front of the public. And when this parliamentary tool is used constructively, it can help in strengthening the democracy. Now let us see how the proceedings of the question hour are regulated. Both the houses of the parliament have a comprehensive set of rules for regulating the business during question hour. As per these rules, the presiding officers of both the houses, they have been designated as the final authority with regard to the conduct of question hour. It means that the presiding officers of both the houses, they decide upon the timings, the questions that are accepted and they also decide upon the kind of supplementary questions that can be allowed. As we already discussed, the rules prescribe that question hour is usually held in the first hour of a parliamentary sitting. But there was an instance in 2014 wherein then Rajya Sabha chairman Hamid Ansari had shifted question hour from 11 am to 12 noon primarily to prevent the frequent disruption of question hour by the opposition parties. Now let us understand as to what kind of questions can be asked by the MPs as per parliamentary rules. The rules of procedure of both the houses states that these questions have to be limited to 150 words and they have to be precise and they cannot be too general in nature. The question that is posed by the MP should be related to an area of responsibility of the government of India, meaning the subject matter under question should fall under the jurisdiction of the Indian government. The rules also prescribe that questions cannot be asked that try to seek secret or classified information and similarly questions that are related to matters that are subjudice are not entertained by the presiding officers of the house. So the final authority to decide whether a question should be accepted or not rests with the presiding officers of the house. Now let us understand how frequently question R is held in a session. See, since the parliament began functioning in 1952, the Lok Sabha rules have stated that question R has to be held every day. Whereas the rules of the Rajya Sabha earlier stated that question R should be held only two days a week, but this was later changed to four days per week. But since 1964, the question R is being held every day during a session in the Rajya Sabha as well. So basically, over the last few decades, question R is being held on all days of the session in both the houses. But there are two days on which an exception is made and please note this down as it can be very important for prelims. As per established parliamentary rules, question R is suspended only on these two days and this includes the day on which the president addresses the parliament, that is when the president makes a speech at the beginning of a new Lok Sabha and as well as on the first day of a new parliament year. The other day on which the question R is suspended is on the day when the finance minister 
presents the budget. Apart from these two days, question hour is not suspended and it is supposed to be held on all days of a week when the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha are in session. But however, there have been a few instances where the question hour was suspended due to extraordinary circumstances and you should be aware of this. See, as per parliamentary records, question hour was suspended during the India-China conflict of 1962. This was the only instance where question hour was suspended during a regular session of the parliament. Apart from this, there have been four special sessions where the question hour has been suspended and this includes the 33rd session in 1961 and the subsequent sessions in 1975, 1976 and 1977. These special sessions were summoned for special reasons such as the passing of the state budget of Odessa which was under president's rule back in 1961 for the proclamation of emergency in 1975, for passing the 44th Amendment Act in 1976 in order to undo the constitutional changes that were brought in during the emergency, then for imposing President's rule in Tamil Nadu Nagaland in 1977. In these four cases, the question R had been suspended because these special sessions had been summoned for special purposes. So the reason why the opposition parties are currently criticizing the government is because the government has proposed to suspend question R in the upcoming monsoon session which happens to be a regular session. As we discussed, there is only one instance where question R was suspended in a regular session that was during the Indo-China conflict of 1962. Now let us talk about the zero R. See unlike the question R, the zero R is not mentioned in the rules of procedure. This is a unique Indian innovation in the field of parliamentary procedures and it was introduced in 1962. The zero R is basically an informal device that is available to the opposition MPs to raise matters without any prior notice. This special R where the opposition can question the government starts immediately after the question R and it lasts until the agenda of the day is brought up. That is until the house starts conducting its regular legislative business. During the zero R, matters that are urgent and are of great public significance and those matters which cannot wait for any notice period are brought up. And for raising these urgent and important questions, the MPs just need to provide a notice before 10 a.m. to the presiding officer of the house on the day of the sitting. The notice must only state the subject that the MP wishes to bring up, but it is left to the discretion of the presiding officer of the house whether to accept such questions or not. Then during the zero hour, short notice questions that are pending from the question hour can also be taken up and the government makes use of the zero hour to lay crucial reports and papers on the floor of the house. This includes the annual reports of ministries and PSUs, the CAG audit reports, the reports of parliamentary standing committees and as well as government notifications. So as per the schedule that has been brought out for the upcoming monsoon session, the government has proposed to suspend question hour completely and to curtail the timings for zero hour. The schedule also informs that private member business that was supposed to be held on every Friday has been cancelled for the upcoming monsoon session. So let us talk about private member business in greater detail. See a private member is any MP of the house who is not a minister of the government. That is any MP who is not a part of the council of ministers is a private member. Even these private members are allowed to table bills and resolutions on the floor of the house. Private members can bring up resolutions by providing a two-day notice in order to make a recommendation or to provide an opinion or to approve or disapprove an act or policy of the government or to raise any important urgent matter in order to bring it to the attention of the government. Every Friday, two and a half hours has been allocated after the conduct of the regular legislative business of the house during which such private business can be taken up. Similarly, private members can also table bills in the house and private member bills and resolutions they are taken up on alternate Fridays. Just like the government introduces a bill in the house, private members can also bring in a bill but they will have to provide a one month notice for this. Usually private member bills are not passed because they may not get the required support but they are brought up by the private members in order to highlight gaps in government bills and draw attention to matters of national concern and to represent public opinion in the house. And the passage of a private member bill follows the same process and procedure as that of a government bill. Till date, the parliament has passed 14 such private member bills 
and six of them were passed back in 1956. As per data that has been collated by PRS Legislative Research, no private member's bill has been passed in the parliament since 1970. And over here, I have given a few examples of private member bills that became laws. Now let's take up another article from page number one. The Indian government has decided to ban around 118 online applications, including popular applications such as PUBG, WeChat Work, etc. Most of these applications are of Chinese origin and the government of India has banned them on the grounds that the usage of these applications by Indians is a threat to India's sovereignty and integrity, to India's defense and national security, and as well as to its public order. The Indian government believes that the usage of these applications, especially those of Chinese origin, can threaten the privacy and the safety of the user and as well as the safety and the security of the Indian cyberspace. So on these grounds, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has invoked its powers under Section 69A of the IT Act along with the relevant provisions of the IT rules of 2009 in order to enforce this ban on these 118 mobile applications. This decision comes as a follow-up to the earlier decision that was taken in June under which India had banned around 59 Chinese applications including popular apps such as TikTok. It is believed that these actions of the Indian government against Chinese applications and against Chinese technology companies is related to the ongoing border tensions with China since May 2020. Indian security agencies believe that the usage of these applications threatens India's national security because they have reason to believe that these apps transmit the user data to foreign servers, especially to those located in China. And considering the proximity of some of these companies with Chinese security agencies and intelligence agencies, they have been flagged as a security threat by Indian security agencies. In fact, these decisions have been made by the Indian government based on the recommendations provided by the Indian Cybercrime Coordination Center, which functions under the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Indian Cybercrime Coordination Center, also known as I4C, has labeled these applications as malicious apps, and it believes that these Chinese mobile and technology companies are involved in mining the user data of Indian citizens and profiling them, which in turn could lead to violation of the user's privacy and as well as threaten the safety and security of the Indian cyberspace. Because Indian security agencies and Western intelligence agencies, they believe that these Chinese companies share a close proximity with China's security and intelligence agencies and under China's restrictive laws, they are bound to share sensitive user data and information which is supposed to be confidential with the Chinese security agencies. Now let us take up an article from page number two which helps us evaluate whether the Indian Air Force is a gender neutral force or a gender biased force. This question has come up in the context of the latest movie that has been produced by Netflix on the life and struggles of Gunjan Saxena who was a pilot with the Indian Air Force and has seen action during the Kargil War. She became one of the first female pilots of the Indian Air Force to have been in combat during the Kargil War and this inspired Netflix to produce a movie based on her life. But apparently, this movie depicts the IAF in a very negative light and it shows that the work culture in the Indian Air Force was not ready to accept a female pilot amongst them. And hence, the IAF has alleged that the movie projects a wrong image about the Indian Air Force and it blames the movie makers for keeping the Indian Air Force in the dark about the real intent of the movie. The IAF has clearly stated that it has always developed a work culture that is gender neutral and accordingly, it has approached the Delhi High Court in order to seek action against this movie which projects the Indian Air Force in a negative light with regard to its outlook towards gender neutrality. To further its arguments, the Indian Air Force has presented to the High Court to show how the armed force has always cultivated a gender neutral work environment since the 1960s itself. In fact, when it comes to the question of women in armed forces and when it comes to gender neutrality in armed forces, the IAF has always taken the lead and it has always been way ahead of the Indian Army and as well as the Indian Navy. Back in the 1960s itself, the Indian Air Force was inducting women in non-combat roles such as in the role of medical officers. In its petition, the IAF refers to Flight Lieutenant Kanta Handa who was a medical officer back in 1966 
who became the first female officer to receive a commendation for her service during the 1965 conflict with Pakistan. Then in 1994, the Indian Air Force became the first armed force in India to induct women as pilots, primarily in support roles. And this is how pilots such as Gunjan Saxena and Sri Vidya Ranjan got to play an active role during the Kargil War. And they became the first women pilots of India to enter into a combat zone. Then through the 1990s, the IAF took the initiative to provide for permanent commission to women officers. And recently in 2015, it has also started inducting women into combat roles. And it has already trained a number of female fighter pilots as well. So by stating these facts, the IAF has said that it has always cultivated a work culture that is gender neutral and it has tried to create a healthy work environment and atmosphere for both the sexes. The IAF has submitted to the court that it has always pursued a policy of fairness when it comes to providing facilities to male and female officers, when it comes to pay and perks and more importantly with regard to promotions. Now let's take up an article from page number 10. The union cabinet has initiated a major civil service reform by approving Mission Karma Yogi. Mission Karma Yogi will essentially be a post-recruitment reform and it will focus on national capacity building for India's civil servants and it will also introduce a performance evaluation and this mission is expected to transform around 4.6 million central government employees into a future ready civil service. These reform measures under Mission Karma Yogi will apply to all levels of the central bureaucracy starting right from the level of IAS and IPS officers going right down to the level of a section officer. These post-recruitment reforms for civil services is expected to supplement the National Recruitment Agency that was set up last week in order to streamline recruitment into the central government. Under Mission Karma Yogi, the HR management policy of the Government of India shall be transformed from a rules-based system to a roles-based system. See, currently within the central government, work allocation for central government officers is primarily done on the basis of rules which limits flexibility and ignores the core competency of each officer. So Mission Karma Yogi is expected to transform this process of work allocation and under this post-recruitment reform, officers shall be deployed and allocated work based on their role and based on their core competency and domain knowledge. Under this mission, through capacity building initiatives, the government hopes to enhance the domain knowledge of central government officers and also further groom their functional and behavioral competencies. These training and capacity building initiatives under Mission Karma Yogi will not only enhance the knowledge and skill sets of central government employees, but it shall also transform their attitude in order to transform the central bureaucracy into a future-ready civil service. Under this mission, a simple and effective monitoring framework shall be set up in order to objectively evaluate the performance of civil servants based on which their career progression and work allotment can be decided. So essentially, Mission Karma Yogi will provide for the integration of all service-related matters such as confirmation of employment under the central government after completing the probationary period deployment of the officer and subsequent work allocation and as well as intimation with regard to notification of vacancies that is internal vacancies within the central government. Then under the capacity building component, Mission Karma Yogi focuses on digital learning or e-learning and it proposes to establish an integrated government online training Karma Yogi digital platform for this purpose. The content for these learning and training programs shall be drawn from global best practices and global standards and it shall also imbibe the values, the principles and the ethos of Indian culture. Then also note that under the current system, once employees are recruited by the central government, their training happens largely off-site, that is they are trained in academies and institutions and they are later sent on-site in order to gain field experience. But during this probationary period, a huge gap has been noticed between off-site learning and on-site experience. So Mission Karma Yogi aims to plug this gap by transforming learning and it aims to shift training from academy-based off-site learning towards on-site field experience. So in order to achieve these ambitious objectives, the government has proposed 
the establishment of a prime minister's public human resource council to guide and direct the implementation of these reforms and it also proposes to establish an independent and autonomous capacity building commission in order to manage the implementation of these reforms now let's take up the practice questions for today who notifies a reserved forest under the provisions of the indian forest act of 1927 the correct answer is option c it is the state government this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 5 the maharashtra government has proposed to declare the ra forest land located near the sanjay gandhi national park in the suburbs of mumbai as a reserved forest see a reserved forest can be set up as per the provisions of the indian forest act of 1927 once an area has been declared and notified as a reserved forest all activities are prohibited unless they are specifically permitted so essentially a reserved forest is a type of a protected area and the powers to declare the establishment of a reserved forest lies with that of the state government as per the indian forest act it is under section 20 of this act that the state government can notify a reserved forest and for this purpose it issues a preliminary notification under section 4 of the act right now this is what the maharashtra government has proposed to do once the preliminary notification is issued the state government shall proceed to appoint a forest settlement officer in order to hear the claims and objections against this preliminary notification the forest settlement officer shall have the powers to enquire into claim of rights such as right of way right of pasture right to forest produce right to a watercourse etc and based on this assessment he may either accept or reject these claims and if additional land has to be procured for the establishment of a reserve forest then the settlement officer can enter into an agreement with the owner of the land to ensure the surrender of his rights or through him the state government can proceed to acquire such land as per the provisions of the land acquisition act so once the settlement process is completed and once all the objections and claims are addressed then finally the state government can notify the establishment of the reserved forest as per section 20 of the indian forest act now let's take up the next question which of the following aircraft is not produced domestically by the hal is it the sukhoi 30 mki or the lca tejas or the rafale fighter jet or the dormier aircraft the correct answer is option c the rafale fighter jet this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 8 the production of aircrafts at hal and its facilities has been severely hit because of the disruption caused to global supply chain by the pandemic now let's take up the next question what are the sanction measures undertaken against individuals listed as global terrorists by the unsc 1267 sanctions committee does it include the freezing of financial and banking assets of the individual does it include the imposition of a travel ban or does it include the imposition of an arms embargo the correct answer is option d all the three sanction measures are undertaken against those individuals who are listed as global terrorists by the unsc 1267 sanctions committee this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 9 pakistan has made an outrageous attempt to list four indian nationals who were working in afghanistan as global terrorists under the unsc 1267 sanctions committee pakistan has alleged that these indian nationals working in afghanistan they were involved in sponsoring india's covert war against pakistan and it has accused them of sponsoring terror outfits such as the tehreek e taliban pakistan and the jamat ul ahrar which carry out attacks against pakistan but this unsubstantiated claim of pakistan and its unjust attempt has been defeated by india's close friends in the unsc such as the united states the united kingdom france germany and belgium so this gives us an opportunity to talk a little more about the unsc 1267 sanctions committee see the united nations security council which is one of the principal organs of the un has the responsibility to maintain international peace and security as a part of this responsibility it can impose sanctions against individuals against organizations and as well as against companies that have gone rogue and are threatening global peace and security over the years these sanction measures have adopted a more targeted approach and in order to impose these sanctions several sanctions committees have been set up under the un security council till date around 14 such sanction committees have been set up and these sanction committees are made up of all the 15 members of the security council that is the permanent five members and the 10 non permanent members these sanctions committee are chaired by a non permanent member on a rotational basis and the 1267 sanctions committee is also known as 
the ISIL Sanctions Committee or the Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee, and sometimes it is also referred to as the Taliban Sanctions Committee. Through the 1267 Sanctions Committee, members of these organizations and those associated with them they are targeted, and measures such as asset freeze, travel ban, and arms embargoes are imposed against them. But however, there are two specific issues that affects the decision making process at the 1267 Sanctions Committee. The first issue is that the decisions are made by consensus. This basically gives a veto to all the 15 members and if a proposal has to go through, it has to be approved by all the 15 countries. So even an objection by a single country can defeat the attempt. And along with this, the 15 member countries are allowed to place a hold on the decision for an indefinite period. And this is how China was blocking India's attempts to designate Masood Azhar as a global terrorist. For nearly one decade, India made multiple attempts to designate Masood Azhar as a global terrorist under the 1267 Sanctions Committee. But each and every time, China was helping out Pakistan by blocking this Indian attempt. Finally, last year, China removed this technical hold on India's proposal and right now Masood Azhar, who established the jaish e muhammad has been designated as a global terrorist. Now let's take up the next question. The Dogri language is predominantly spoken in which region? The correct answer is option C, Jammu. Now let's take up the next question. Which seaport is considered as the largest private port of India? The correct answer is option B, the Mundra port in the state of Gujarat. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The merchandise exports from India scheme provides rewards to exporters to offset infrastructural inefficiencies and associated costs. It enables employment generation in key export-oriented sectors and helps increase India's competitiveness. It was introduced under the Foreign Trade Policy of India 2015-20. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. Now let's take up the next question. Port Pipawa will benefit from which project? The correct answer is option A, the Western Dedicated Freight Corridor. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2015 prelims paper. Who of the following was or were economic critics of colonialism in India? Dadabai Naroji, G. Subramanya Ayer, R. C. Dutt. All the three are correct. Option D is the right answer. All the three mentioned individuals developed an economic critic of colonialism. For example, the drain theory of Dadabai Naroji. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, discuss the significance of question R in the Indian Parliament. Critically analyze the recent changes introduced to it as a result of the pandemic. The second question, the Indian Air Force has tried to promote a gender neutral work culture. Discuss. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. This concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.